What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we are going to be talking about lung masses. We're primarily going to focus on lung cancer, but we'll sprinkle in a couple other things in there like solitary pulmonary nodules, and we'll briefly talk about mediastinal masses. Let's go ahead and get started. So when we talk about neoplasias pretty much within the chest, obviously one of the big things is like this little cavity kind of situated in the center. So you obviously have your thoracic cavity, and in the thoracic cavity, kind of in the midline, you have something called the mediastinum. So sometimes masses can appear in the mediastinum that can distort the abnormality of normal structures when you look at it on a chest x-ray. And it's important to quickly be able to associate what are some of those things that could actually be causing this mass? And so you have to quickly remember your actual anatomy of the mediastinum. We're not gonna spend a ton of time, I wanna briefly go through this, but when we look at the mediastinum, we're gonna take a cross section here. So here's gonna be the right lung, here's gonna be the left lung, here's gonna be the vertebrae. This structure here is the sternum, okay? There's three main compartments of the mediastinum that I want you to know. The anterior mediastinum, which is gonna go from the sternum all the way up into the anterior por portion of the pericardium of the heart. So within this area, just right here, what are some tissue structures that could actually become abnormal, cause masses to appear on your chest x-ray? Big thing to think about, remember the four T's. So one is thymoma, terrible lymphoma, because there's lymph node tissue in there. Retrosternal thyroidal goiter, okay? So someone has a big old thyroid goiter and it's actually going downwards into the actual posterior part of the sternum. So again, thymoma, terrible lymphoma, retrosternal thyroidal goiter, and then one more thing, you know tumors, germ cell tumors called teratomas can also sometimes appear in here. So I'll represent that as kind of like a little, a blackish tumor here. Sometimes teratomas can also extend into the anterior mediastinum. So think about those things. Now, the middle mediastinum is generally gonna go from the anterior portion of the pericardium to around this area. You see right here we have the trachea where it bifurcates into the primary bronchi. That area from here to here is the middle mediastinum. So any kind of structures in there that actually develop tumors could obviously cause distortion there. So think about sometimes a tracheal tumor, a bronchial tumor, and what is all this green stuff around there? Lymph node tissue, so lymphoma. Those are other big things to be thinking about within the middle mediastinum. The posterior mediastinum is gonna go generally right behind the bifurcation of the trachea all the way to your vertebra. So all the things in this posterior mediastinum can also become abnormal, grow masses, and distort the anatomy. What are those things? Esophageal tumors, what are these green things? Lymph node tissue, so lymphomas. You also have a lot of nerve sheaths around here, so nerve sheath tumors, particularly of the sympathetic plexus of the vagus nerve, and then, you know sometimes there's a tumor that can actually extend into the actual bone marrow and cause all these bone marrow neoplasms, such as multiple myeloma. So these are the big things to be able to think about. So as a quick recap here, whenever we have patients who have mediastinal masses, it's important to be able to understand the anatomy and what are the structures within them. Anterior, what are they? Terrible fours, retrosternal, thyroidal goiter, lymph terrible lymphoma, thymoma, teratoma. For middle, bronchial tumors, tracheal tumors, and lymphoma, for posterior lymphoma, esophageal tumors, nerve sheath tumors, and multiple myeloma. But here's the last thing. Big thing, kind of leading us into the next topic, is that sometimes a patient has a lung cancer, so they have a lung mass, some type of lung cancer, we're gonna talk about that next. Guess what is one of the most common causes of extension into like the middle mediastinum, posterior mediastinum, or anterior mediastinum? some type of lung met. So remember, lung is a very common, lung cancer is a very common type of cancer that can metastasize to the mediastinum and distort that structure. Let's talk about lung cancer now. All right, my friends, so now let's talk about lung cancer. When we talk about lung cancer, we can easily divide these. Now, most of the time it's divided into two types, small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. There's one other less common tumor, so we're gonna br briefly pass over that quickly. But when we talk about small cell carcinoma or small cell lung cancers, one of the big things is that this is a part of a neuroendocrine tumor group, okay? And there's two main neuroendocrine tumors that you guys should know for your step two. One is the big one, small cell lung cancer, okay? This accounts for about 25% of the actual lung cancers that you'll see. Now, one of the big things I think is really important, especially for understanding features and what to look for on the, the actual imaging studies, is where these actual carcinomas primarily situate themselves within the lung tissue. And small cell lung cancer tends to be more of a centrally located type of tumor. So that's what I really want you guys to remember. Whenever you think about small cell lung cancer, I want you to think about a centrally 
located. It's going to be more involving the central part of the lungs, near the actual bronchi, near the medial portion of the lungs. Again, that's the primary thing with small cell lung cancer. Now, there's another one called carcinoid tumor. Now, carcinoid tumor is another type of neuroendocrine tumor, meaning that they have the ability to produce hormones. You'll see later that small cell lung cancer can produce something called perineoplastic syndrome, where it releases tons and tons of different hormones, a really interesting process. Same thing with carcinoid tumors. Carcinoid tumors tend to have a little bit of a mixture. So you can also find them primarily, most of the time, centrally located type of tumors. So they're primarily centrally located. But on some small percentage, they do have some peripheral involvement. So it is important to remember that they are primarily a centrally located tumor near the actual bronchial system. But on the small occasion, they can also be located peripherally. Okay, now when we talk about these, this gives us the conversation of the neuroendocrine tumor. Small cell lung cancer is the big one. Really want you guys to remember this one. And carcinoid tumors. Big thing, these are tumors that can release hormones. Very, very, this one, very nasty type of lung cancer. Again, small cell, centrally located. Carcinoid, more centrally, has a little bit of peripheral involvement. Key here, okay? Let's now talk about the next component, which is the non-small cell lung cancer. So they're not small cell lung cancers, okay? There's a couple different types here. And the big thing to remember for this one is this accounts for most of our lung cancers, like 75% of the cases. So 75% of the cases that we'll see with lung cancer, it's likely non-small cell. Now, what are the different types of non-small cell? Now, one of those is squamous cell carcinoma. So squamous cell carcinoma is just the configuration. So it takes over some of the you know, pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue that we have within our bronchial system or simple, you know, generally some of that structures that we have there and turns it into more of a squamous type of tissue, but it's a neoplasia. And usually what I want you to remember is this is primarily centrally located type of tumor. Big, big things, man. I'm telling you, it's really important because this is gonna help us to determine the features and complications because more centrally located tumors will have very specific comp uh, features and complications, whereas the peripheral ones will have very specific features and complications and things that we can pick up on their imaging studies. All right, there's squamous cell. The next one is adenocarcinoma. Now adenocarcinoma, I do want you to remember that this is the most common, maybe accounting for upwards of 40% of the non-small cell lung cancers in comparison to squamous cell, large cell, and bronchoalveolar carcinoma. So big thing that may come up in the exam, or if you're trying to figure it out, which is this non-small, which non-small cell, small cell lung cancer is this? Well, the most common one is like one that they're likely going to test you on. So it would be adenocarcinoma. Now, adenocarcinoma usually is going to be involving some of the actual mucinous producing cells, whereas large cells, this, these again are very big types of tumors, thus the name large cell carcinoma. Where are these primarily located? Again, guess what? These are primarily peripheral. So you're like, oh, okay, finally, we got a peripheral located one. So whenever you think about adenocarcinoma or large cell carcinoma, think about tumors that are going to be more involving the periphery of the lungs rather than the central location that you see in squamous, small cell, and again, more carcinoid, but a little bit of peripheral. The last one here, my friends, is called bronchoalveolar carcinoma. So this is kind of like a subset of adeno. And usually, you know what the highest risk factor for this one is? We'll talk about in a second, asbestos exposure. And we'll talk about the causes that are big reasons for lung cancer, but bronchoalveolar is a mixture. It's just like carcinoid tumor. So you're gonna see it mainly central, but guess what you also will see? You can see some peripheral involvement as well. So it's important to remember that for this one, you can see it both central and peripheral for the bronchoalveolar carcinoma. All right, so when we have these all situated together, we got squamous cell carcinoma, primarily central. We have adenocarcinoma, large cell carcinoma. We gotta write these down that this is primarily peripheral. And then we have the bronchoalveolar carcinoma, which is gonna be a mixture of central and peripheral. The last thing that we have to talk about, now that we understand the different types of lung cancers, where they're primarily situated, their most common types of cancers that you'll see within this, we have to talk about what are the things that can actually cause these cancers. Let's go over that quick. All right, so when we talk about causes, I think this is really important. Most of the causes, if you guys are gonna see them, it's gonna be a patient who smokes. Cigarette smoking is gonna be the most common cause. You know how important this is? 80 to 90% of the cases are gonna be due to cigarette smoking. But there's one exception that you may see on the exam that you have to know. Do not forget this. This is why I kind of made this red. I'm going to asterisk it. 
it's not an adenocarcinoma. So adenocarcinoma is one of the only lung cancers that have no association with smoking. It's more likely associated with genetics or some type of going off of that family history. So if they have a genetic predisposition, so some type of mutation, or they have a family history that's allowed for them to pass on that particular mutation, these are the things that puts patients for adenocarcinoma at high risk, okay? Again, smoking, most common cause for most of these lung cancers, the only one that is not adenocarcinoma. Don't forget that. The other things is like rat radon exposure, asbestics exposure, any other kinds of occupational types of like, you know, hazardous materials. But I think one of the big things with asbestos exposure is that this really has a high association of bronchoalveolar carcinoma, like I told you. But guess what else? It also has a very high risk of mesothelioma. We're not going to talk about this as a part of the lung cancer category. We already talked about it in the interstitial lung disease when we talked about asbestosis. But mesothelioma would be a cancer that's involving the pleura. Okay, so it's going to be causing inflammation of the visceral pleura, parietal pleura, and causing cancerous cells to develop there. Remember, what else does asbestosis cause? They cause the pleural plaques at the bases of the lungs. So again, big things to be thinking about. And the reason I drew these, I just wanted to test your memory. If we took a, uh, a bronchoalveolar lavage or a sputum sample of a patient with asbestosis, what would these things be called on the actual microscopy? Ferruginous bodies. Remember the little dumbbell things that we saw. Anyway, I thought that would be a cool little test of your memory. But we have the basic causes, the understanding of lung cancer. Before we go on to the features and complications, we now have to have a very brief discussion about when we see maybe a chest x-ray or a CT scan and we see what looks like a mass, how do we know if it's actually not a malignant type of neoplasia? So in other words, some type of lung cancer that we just talked about or something benign. So we'll talk about that now. All right, so the next thing that we have to talk about is something called a solitary pulmonary nodule. This will come up on your exam, so you have to be able to recognize it. You get a patient who comes in, they're asymptomatic, likely, and they get a chest x-ray, CT scan, something of that nature, and then incidentally, they find a what looks like a mass in their lung tissue. But it may not be malignant, it may honestly just be a benign type of tissue there. And so we have to be able to differentiate what is the likelihood of this being a solitary pulmonary nodule and then having a differential in our head. Could this be benign? If it is benign, what are the things to think about? What's the likelihood of it being benign? What's the likelihood of it being malignant? If it is malignant, what kind of things could it be, potentially be? So first thing, we, let's have here a pulmonary nodule. So here we're going to have just like a nodule of tissue, definitely looks abnormal in comparison to the surrounding lung tissue. How do we define a pulmonary nodule? One of the key things is that it is less than three centimeters. That's one big thing. Second thing is that all the tissue surrounding the actual pulmonary nodule is normal lung tissue. So normal lung surrounding the pulmonary nodule. That's huge. All right. And then last thing is that there is no lymphadenopathy. So no nearby lymph nodes that are being involved from the tumor. Okay. This is key things to be able to think about whenever you're likely suspicious that this is a benign finding, a benign solitary pulmonary nodule. Okay. Less than three centimeters, normal surrounding lung tissue and no lymphadenopathy. Now, when we think about pulmonary nodules, we have the thought, is this a uh, you know, a malignant or a benign type of tumor. And so oftentimes you can kind of rest at ease that it is likely 70% of the time benign. And when you think it is benign, to have a differential. So things that you're going to potentially test for if you're going to go down the route of doing a bronchoscopy, doing a biopsy, whatever it may be. The big thing is if you see a pulmonary nodule and it kind of fits the category of less than three centimeters, normal surrounding lung tissue, no lymphadenopathy, think about granulomatous diseases. So granulomas can definitely cause this kind of like nodular appearance. And so think about things that cause granulomas. One of the big things would be tuberculosis. So tuberculosis could be one particular disease. Another one would be your fungal infections. This will definitely come up on your exam. So maybe histio, um, histoplasmosis or coccidiomycosis. So these are big things to think about. So histo or coccidio mycoses. So those fungal infections that you guys remember that we talked about before. All right, so granulomatous diseases, 80% of the time, it's likely gonna be something like TB, fungal infections. The other time, it can be 10% of the time, hamartomas. So these are kind of like these abnormal collection or mixture of abnormal tissues that is a benign type of like nodule. 
10% of the time it could be hamartoma. So whenever they say, okay, you think it's benign, definitely has the characteristics to suggest a benign type of mass, what are the differential? You say granulomatous disease is most of the time TB, histo, or coccidial. The other 10% likely hamartoma. And then for the remaining 10%, because we had 80, 10, there's like something missing here, it would be any kind of other miscellaneous causes that are not worth even us mentioning it in this video. Okay? Now the next thing is, could it be malignant? What's the chances that it could be malignant? There is a chance. So 70 remaining a percentage is 30%. So there still is a chance. So you have to be on alert for that. Now, if you think it's malignant, we will talk about things that are more suspicious for malignancy, such as what's the age of the patient? Has the nodule changed over the previous couple of years, maybe two years? Does it have irregular borders? Does it have asymmetric calcifications? Is there other types of particular things that are very concerning for malignancy? And we will discuss that later in the diagnostic section. But for right now, you have a suspicion that it could be potentially malignant or you're thinking about your differential, guess what? It's relatively easy. If there's a nodule that you suspect is malignant, go back to all of the ones that we just talked about. Unlikely that it's small cell because when people find small cell, it's usually too late. They have about a two year survival rate at that point in time because it's usually extensive. So think about all the bronchogenic carcinomas that we talked about, such as squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, large cell carcinoma, maybe bronchoalveolar carcinoma as well, but again, these are the big things to think about. 75% of the time, it actually is one of these malignant neoplasias. And then, could it be metastatic? Could it have come from breast uh, cancer? Could it have come from uh, some type of colorectal cancer? Could it have come from somewhere else and that it spread to the lungs? Oftentimes, if it's metastatic, it's less likely because you'll have multiple pulmonary nodules if it's metastatic, usually not just one solitary nodule. So that's the big things to think about. So we got a pulmonary nodule as a part of our other types, causes, pathophys for these kind of thoracic or respiratory neoplasias that I want you guys to remember. Less than three centimeters, normal surrounding lung tissue, no lymphadenopathy, could be benign. Think about granulomas, TB, histo, coccidio, hamartomas is the remaining. If you have a suspicion that's malignant, and we'll talk about what things are suspicious for malignancy for pulmonary nodules. Think about the lung cancers that we just talked about with the exception, unlikely small cell because of how extensive that disease is or metastatic. Less likely though, because usually if it's metastatic, you have multiple nodules all over the place. It's more of a kind of a distant spread and usually more than one nodule. All right, beautiful. That covers the types, the causes, the pathophys for our actual chest or respiratory neoplasias. Let's now go over really key thing here, features and complications. All right, so when we talk about the features, complications, we're gonna primarily talk about lung cancer. That's gonna be the big, big thing for us to discuss. Oftentimes, solitary pulmonary nodules, they're asymptomatic, they're incidental findings. Mediastinal masses, often they're due to compression. So you might get some of the similar effects that you'll see in lung cancer, but we're not gonna harp on that too much. I just want us to primarily focus on the features and complications of the lung cancers that we discussed. That being the small cell, non-small cell lung cancer, and then carcinoid tumors. All right, so general features that you may see from all of these cancers is that they may have a general sense of maybe low-grade fevers, weight loss, and some generalized fatigue or malaise. Why? Could be a couple reasons. One of the reasons is that the tumor may actually gain the capacity to make specific types of cytokines, maybe things like interleukin-1, tumor necrotic factor alpha, and stimulate the hypothalamus. And when it stimulates the hypothalamus, it can actually cause the temperature center, the thermal regulation center within the hypothalamus and our hunger centers and our hypothalamus to be undergo a dysregulation process. So then what it can do is it can jack up our temperature because it controls our thermal regulation. So if it jacks up our temperature, it can lead to these low-grade fevers. It also can affect our hunger center, which may decrease the ability or the desire to want to eat. So there's a decreased appetite, therefore leading to weight loss. Here's the other thing. Because the cancer is getting so much types of like blood flow, there's lots of blood flow to these actual bad boys. What happens is that these cancer cells consume massive amounts of oxygen and glucose, and so they are just chewing through our energy reserves. If you chew through the energy reserves, that can actually lead to a big kind of caloric deficit, as well as leading to weight loss, and since your tumor is consuming a lot of the oxygen and glucose rather than your muscles and other tissues that need to be utilizing it to perform normal daily functions, you may have some generalized fatigue and weakness. So these are two of the theories behind why these patients develop this. One is maybe due to a cytokine release that tells the hypothalamus to change the thermoregulation center and the hunger center, causing us to develop fever and weight loss. The other theory is that this could be due to the tumor consuming lots of oxygen and nutrients that our other body tissues are supposed to be consuming, but it has less of it because it's consuming most of that energy. 
What are some other features that are really important? Here's the big thing. When you have a tumor that is centrally located, you know how most of these tumors are centrally located? Do you guys remember which one that would be? Small cell lung cancer, squamous cell lung cancer, and maybe even uh, carcinoid tumors or bronchoalveolar carcinomas, which have central and peripheral. The only ones that we said that were not pretty much central would be the adenocarcinomas and the large cell carcinomas. Since they have tumors that are more centrally located, they can either be present inside the bronchioles or they can be outside of the bronchioles and compressing the actual bronchioles nearby. So you can get an endobronchial growth, which can lead to these features, or you can have a tumor on the outside that's compressing on the bronchial system just as the same as if there was a tumor inside the lumen. So you guys get the point. There's either a tumor in the lumen or there's a tumor outside of it compressing on the lumen. What are some features that you can see with that? Well, think about this. If you have a cancer here, what, this, what happens is this can cause some localized inflammation and increased blood vessel flow. Whenever that localized inflammation is there, guess what? It stimulates these nearby cough receptors. And these cough receptors, when they're agitated or activated by inflammation, what do you think they produce? A cough reflex. So oftentimes these patients may present with a cough due to the localized inflammation caused by the actual neoplasia. Second thing is that these neoplasias, imagine here, you have kind of an actual bronchial tissue here. And then you know within the bronchial tissue here, we're gonna have, let's say the tumor is endobronchial. So here's our tumor now. What happens is we know that you get lots of blood supply. Neoplasias definitely increase the angiogenesis process so that they can get more blood supply to be able to get more oxygen, more nutrients to continue to grow. What happens now is, is that sometimes there can be an erosion of some of these vessels within the bronchial wall. And then these blood vessels can start to spew, spew, right into the actual lumen of the bronchial system. And then that can be coughed up. What is that called when you're coughing up blood? Homoptysis. So we got cough reflex activated from local activation. We got neoplasias having increased vascularity, chewing away at the actual uh, vessels sometimes can lead to blood moving into the lumen causing homoptysis. What else? Imagine you got this tumor obstructing the lumen. What's supposed to be moving through there? Air. Air is supposed to be moving in and out. But now you have an obstruction which is going to be decreasing airflow through this bronchial system, decreasing airflow through this bronchial system. If I can't have a good amount of air coming in, what am I gonna try to do to augment that? I'm not bringing in adequate tidal volumes. I'm going to try to breathe faster or deeper. And so this makes the patients look like they're very short of breath because they're working really hard to take in deeper breath because they have an obstruction within their airway. And so they may have dyspnea. The other thing is when they exhale, if you have a tumor here, it's not completely obstructing the lumen, but you have a tumor here and you're trying to exhale, now that air has to move through that tiny little area of the lumen during exhalation. When the air is moving out during exhalation, it may cause a wheezing type of response. So again, think about activated inflammation, cough reflex, increased vascular supply enough that it actually starts kind of getting pushed into the lumen, hemoptysis. Third thing is you have less airflow coming in because of obstruction of the airway, leading to dyspnea, and then less air getting out during expiration causing wheezing. One other thing, is that normally, if I have an obstruction within the actual bronchial system, normally mucus is supposed to move up through the bronchioles and be coughed out. But if I have some type of big obstruction that's preventing this mucus from being able to be expelled outward because it's obstructing it, now bacteria can just multiply and thrive in this mucus rich area. And then now I create an opportunity for an infection, which is called pneumonia. So we call this post-obstructive pneumonia. Big things that I want you guys to think about with this is that this is more common with central tumors. So central tumors. Do you guys remember why I harped on that, okay? So cough, hemoptysis, dyspnea, wheezing, post-obstructive pneumonia. I hope that part made sense. The second thing is nearby compression. So if I have a tumor that, again, is more centrally located, and what it starts doing is, is it starts crowding around the mediastinum and compressing on structures near the mediastinum. What are some of the effects that I can start to see? All right, so same thing, central tumors. So think about central tumors with the actual nearby compression of structures in the mediastinum. Well, one is you have this nerve called the recurrent laryngeal nerve. You know, if you compress that, it actually can lead to hoarseness of the voice. 
You can also compress the esophagus. If you compress the esophagus, now there's difficulty in being able to swallow. This leads to dysphagia. And then you can compress onto this big structure here, which brings venous blood from above the diaphragm. This can compress the suprivena cava, lead to SVC syndrome, where they have upper extremity edema, discoloration, chest wall edema, discoloration, massive JVD. Think about these things in central tumors. All right, so we got, again, endobronchial growth or compression, central tumors, nearby mediastinal compression, central tumors. These are the big things I need you to think about. Okay, now let's move over and talk about a couple other features that you can see with these. And one of the big things that I want you to think about is things that you can see with the peripheral tumors. All right, so the next thing that we need to talk about, we said, you know, generally plural disorders. That's going to be near your periphery, right? So when we talk about plural disorders that are associated with lung cancer, you'd be associating this more with the peripheral lung cancers or peripheral lung tumors. So plural disorders, think about these more particularly in those peripheral types of lung tumors. So again, think about which ones those were. We said adenocarcinoma, large cell, and then technically you could even consider a little bit of the carcinoid, a little bit of the bronchoalveolar, but not squamous cell and not small cell, okay? Now with these, generally as you have a tumor that gets close to the actual visceral and parietal pleura, what can it lead to? Well, one is it can lead to pleural effusion, second it can lead to pneumothorax. Brief little discussion because we'll go over these in pleural disorders that we'll talk about in a separate lecture. But when you have malignancy, obviously there's going to cause an increase inflammation. So malignancies can actually release certain types of chemicals that can increase the inflam inflammation nearby and cause the blood vessels to become super leaky. If the blood vessels become super leaky, they can leak a lot of that fluid, some of the plasma fluid and proteins and different cells into the actual pleural cavity and lead to a pleural effusion. So think about that with these patients, more likely peripheral tumors. Now at the same situation, if you had a tumor that's near the actual visceral and parietal pleura and it's trying to grow and grow and grow, and what it does is it has the opportunity that it actually starts eating away at the visceral pleura. Then you can create like a fistula, if you will, between the parenchyma and the pleural cavity. And then air is going to easily enter into the pleural cavity, and as air enters into the pleural cavity, this is known as a pneumothorax. So think about these two types of disorders that you would likely more see with peripheral lung tumors. Pleural effusions, more of an exudative type of effusion due to increased capillary permeability, or you know what else? Lymphatic vessels. They can compress lymphatic vessels. You know you have lymphatic vessels that are actually located within the pleural cavity? and they're supposed to take some of the fluid out. Sometimes if you have a tumor that's large enough that's actually compressing on this lymphatic uh, vessel, it can actually do what? Decrease the drainage of the pleural fluid, and that can also lead to this problem too. So it could be due to exudative, due to increased capillary permeability, or decreased fluid clearance because of compression of lymphatic vessels. All right. That would cover the pleural disorders associated with lung tumors. Now, let's talk about one special type of appearance that you can see with two types of tumors, Panko's tumors. You can see this with two types, and we'll talk about that in just a second. One is adenocarcinoma, and the other one is squamous cell. So this one, you're probably like, wait, I thought there's usually like a central peripheral. This one's very interesting. So squamous cell, we obviously know is more centrally located. And then adenocarcinoma, we know is more peripherally located. When we look at Panko's tumors, Panko's tumors are tumors that can develop right on the apex of the lung. So usually, if you see a Panko's tumor, it's going to be right here at the apexes or the apices of the lungs. And technically, if it's more centrally located, that's definitely close to the apexes. And again, peripheral, you see adenocarcinoma. So big things to think about with Panko's tumors, usually tumors near the apices of the lungs associated with adeno and squamous cell. It used to be primarily squamous cell, but we've seen a higher incidence with adenocarcinoma. Let's talk about the presentation of Panko's tumors now. All right, so if you guys remember, when we talk about the apices, we have like, generally you have your sternum right here, but you're going to have a rib here. This is going to be your first rib. And right around the area of the first rib, you're going to have your apices of the lungs. But you know what else you have? You have like a lot of a neurovascular bundle. So you have a lot of nerves that are going to be running within this vicinity here. So lots and lots of nerves running within this vicinity here. And then also you're going to have lots of blood vessels that are running within this vicinity here. So definitely lots of blood vessels and a, neuro, like a nice neurovascular bundle, if you will, running near the apices of the lungs near the first rib. If this tumor is growing near the apices, it can compress onto these blood vessels and compress onto these neuro bundles. 
what would be the features that we would see if it's compressing on the nerves and compressing on the vasculature? Great question. If it's compressing on the nerves, you need to know what nerves are in that vicinity of the lung apices. One is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. You compress it, you get hoarseness of the voice. The other one is the phrenic nerve. Phrenic nerve surprise the supplies the diaphragm. So if you had a right pancos tumor, you would have hemiparalysis of the you'd have paralysis of the right hemi diaphragm. If the right hemi diaphragm isn't working, it can't dome down. You won't get as good of a chest expansion on the right side. So you'll have unilateral decreased chest expansion on that right side. The other thing is if you look at the chest x-ray, because it can't contract and come down, their diaphragm's super elevated on that side that's affected. So look for hemi diaphragm elevation and decreased chest expansion on the affected side. The other thing is it can compress the sympathetic nerves. You know the sympathetic plexus? Uh, specifically supplies the upper eyelid, helps to be able to supply the pupil and supplies the sweat glands around the actual head, face, neck area. Guess what? If you compress that, you won't allow for them to be able to dilate the pupil. Guess what they'll do? Constrict. This is called my meiosis. They won't be able to keep their upper eyelid elevated. It will droop. This is called ptosis. And they won't be able to sweat around their forehead and near their face. That's called anhydrosis. This is a triad for the sympathetic plexus compression called Horner syndrome. Okay? The last thing is there's the brachial plexus near this area. Guess what happens if you smash on that brachial plexus? It's supposed to supply the muscles and also provide sensation to the upper limbs. You can develop paresthesias. You could develop even pain if it's really bad. And on top of that, weakness of the upper extremity muscles. So those are big things to think about with the nerve compression aspect. What about the vascular compression? You could compress the artery. So if you did compress like the subclavian artery or near the axillary artery, you could develop reduced perfusion to the skin. So decreased pulses on the effect side is a possibility, but you're more likely to see venous compression because it's easier to collapse those. And so there's the brachiocephalic vein that runs in this area and the superior vena cava, just the tip of it. And so you can compress these two bad boys. If you can compress the brachiocephalic vein or potentially the top of the superior vena cava, you're not going to drain into the right atrium. So all the blood flow will back up into the upper extremities, the neck, the chest, and you'll develop upper extremity, neck, chest wall edema, discoloration, and significant plumped up JVD. Okay? Big things to think about with pancos tumors that you see with adeno squamous. Used to be squamous is the most common. Adeno is becoming the more common one that we see. All right. The next thing that we have to talk about is perineoplastic syndromes. All right, my friends, so now perineoplastic syndrome is a huge thing that they definitely will likely test you on on the exam, so you have to know it. All right, so the first thing we want to think about is if we have a patient that we suspect has some type of lung cancer, right? We look at their potential etiology. They definitely smoke a lot of cigarettes. They have some type of lung mass on their imaging. And you have a concern that they may have a perineoplastic syndrome. What are the things to think about and which lung cancer is it associated with? So squamous cell carcinoma is really interesting in the fact that it gains the ability to be able to produce a very special type of hormone called parathyroid hormone related peptide. It acts just like parathyroid hormone. So what it does is it'll help to be able to act at the kidney and really cause the kidney to increase the reabsorption of calcium into the blood and then excrete phosphate into the urine. That's one thing. The other thing is it'll also act on the bone tissue and cause the activation of osteoclasts to be able to increase osteoclastic activity, breaking down the bone to liberate more calcium and liberate more phosphate from the bone. The end result is that now you're pushing a lot of calcium into the blood via reabsorption or via bone, depo uh, bone resorption. If that happens, what happens to the calcium levels in the blood? They increase. So if you have a patient, you're ordering some routine blood work for them, and you notice that they have hypercalcemia, consider if they have a lung mass checking a PTHRP level as well as a normal PTH level to say, is this a hypercalcemia due to hyperparathyroidism, elevated PTH, or is it a hypercalcemia of malignancy due to a squamous cell carcinoma? All right, next one. Adenocarcinoma, the primary one that I want you to remember is this top one here. It gains the ability to produce a very specific type of hormone that activates fibroblasts. You know, fibroblasts, they love to respond to transforming growth factor beta. And so we have tissue in our bone that have fibroblasts or the dense connective tissue, the periosteum around the bone that have lots of fibroblast tissue. These fibroblasts become activated. When the fibroblasts become activated, they start increasing the 
periosteal deposition, making the actual thickness around the bones like way, way thicker, especially near the fingers. And so what you see is you see some hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. I'll show you guys a picture of this, of sometimes patients' fingers, how they can actually look whenever you have a significant hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. It looks like this. All right. That's one big thing that I really want you to remember with adenocarcinoma. The second thing that we have seen somewhat, I don't want you to go too crazy in remembering these last two, but think about it, possibly if they present on the exam. With adenocarcinoma, it also has the ability to increase the production of procoagulants. So actual molecules that want to induce clotting. And so if I increase the procoagulants, I'm going to increase the clot formation. If I increase clot formation, this can create a hypercoagulable state, putting the patient at risk for things like an acute ischemic stroke, putting them at risk for an acute myocardial infarction, putting them at risk of an acute limb ischemia, acute mesenteric ischemia, et cetera. These are big things to think about, as well as maybe even DVTs, DVT, PE. So really, really important thing to consider. The last thing is they can actually increase the activation of plasma cells to increase the production of antibodies and antibodies that are actually going to attack skeletal muscle tissue as well as cutaneous tissues. And so this can cause something called inflammatory myopathies. This is specifically dermatomyositis. So they develop inflammation of their actual skeletal muscle cells and a lot of proximal muscle weakness. So usually you'll see weakness, particularly of the shoulder joint and hip joint, but also they'll have a lot of skin findings. Gotrin's papules, they'll have like the shawl sign. They may have some like uh, inflammation or in, uh, kind of like rashes around their actual face as well. So maybe kind of like a heliotrope rash on their, on their uh, eyelids. But big thing to think about here with adenocarcinoma is hypertrophic osteoarthropathy due to increased fibroblast tissue, as well as increased risk of hypercoagulable states, and last one, dermatomyositis. All right, the next one is carcinoid tumor. So carcinoid tumors are one of those neuroendocrine tumors that gain the ability to make serotonin. Serotonin is a very interesting type of hormone that whenever it's released, it can act on the smooth muscle of our bronchioles, it can act on the smooth muscle of our GI tract, and it can act on the smooth muscle of the blood vessels on the skin. And what it does on the smooth muscle in the bronchioles is cause bronchoconstriction. If you cause bronchoconstriction of the actual bronchioles, less air is gonna be able to move out during expiration. This will produce wheezing. It'll produce contraction of the smooth muscle within the GIT. If you have increased smooth muscle GIT contraction, what is that gonna do? It's gonna cause things to move quicker through the GIT. You'll be peeing out your bunghole. This is diarrhea. And then it'll also cause the smooth muscle within the, va uh, the actual vasculature supplying the skin to dilate. And there'll be increased capillary blood flow of the skin, which produce a flushing type of appearance. Don't forget this classic trial with carcinoid syndrome. Increased serotonin, they present with wheezing, diarrhea, flushing of the skin. And if you were to check their serotonin levels or uh, a breakdown metabolite of it, uh, they would be elevated as well. Are you notice that I didn't mention large cell? We're gonna have to talk about small cell here in just a second, but you're like, wait, what happened to large cell carcinoma? What? That one doesn't really have much of it. There's one theory behind that it actually can increase the production of what's called um, HCG, so human chorionic gonadotropin, which may cause gynecomastia or gynecomastia in males or galactorrhea in females, but that's kind of like, it's not actually completely evidence-based, so we're not gonna mention that one. It's not usually tested that often. I see the big ones to be thinking about is squamous cell, carcinoid, and this next one called small cell lung cancer. So really focus on these perineoplastic syndromes. Let's talk about small cell now. All right, so like I told you, when perineoplastics, the big ones that I want to remember are squamous cell carcinoma, hypercalcemia. Adeno, you can consider the hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. That's the big one for that one. Carcinoid syndrome, particularly wheezing, diarrhea, and again, some type of flushing that you would see at carcinoid tumors. But this is gonna be the real, real big one that you may get tested on, which is the small cell lung cancer. So really focus here, guys. So this tumor may gain the ability to release a couple different hormones. One of them is called adrenocorticotropic hormone. If you release adrenocorticotropic hormone, you have to remember that ACTH actually stimulates the actual uh, adrenal glands, the adrenal cortex, to make cortisol. If cortisol levels are super, super elevated, they can cause lipolysis, they can increase your blood glucose levels, they can cause hypertension, they can cause fat kind of deposition in weird areas, especially in the face and on the back where they cause the swollen moon face, the buffalo hump, they depress your immune system, and all of these things can lead to the presentation of 
Cushing syndrome. So if a patient presents with features of Cushing syndrome, hyperglycemia, hypertension, um, hypernatremia, they have a lot of edema, they have fat deposition in weird areas such as the buffalo hump, swollen moon face, striae due to the pendular type of uh, abdominal obesity, really stretching out that tissue causing abdominal striae. Think about this type of cancer, small cell lung cancer. Okay, the next one, it has the ability to produce lots of ADH. So whenever you produce lots of ADH, ADH generally works at the kidneys to be able to do what? Increase water reabsorption. So it'll basically take and say, hey, let's increase the amount of water that's being reabsorbed from the kidneys, and that means less water will show up in the urine. If that happens and you just keep increasing your water reabsorption, guess what? You have so much water that it actually drowns out or dilutes your sodium. And so it will actually cause like a dilutional type of effect of the sodium. And this will lead to hyponatremia, low serum levels of sodium within the blood. But that hyponatremia is due to an elevated amount of ADH. And so we call this syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. This is a tumor where it's making lots of ADH. So if you see a patient with hyponatremia, think about this where they'll have less water in their actual urine, okay, they have a tumor and they're pumping out this ADH levels, okay? So big thing, so Cushing syndrome, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. The next one is they can stimulate plasma cells to make antibodies. And these antibodies like to go and attack various tissues. One of them is they can attack the central nervous system. When they attack the central nervous system, they can attack the cortex. And if they attack the cortex, this can lead to agitation of the cortex. If you agitate the cerebral cortex, this can lead to increased action potentials leading to seizures. They also love to attack the cerebellum. And so they can cause cerebellum degeneration leading to ataxia, nystagmus. Think about that in a patient, okay? So again, if they attack the CNS, seizures, supertentorial. If they attack the cerebellum, infratentorial, think about ataxia, nystagmus. The other thing is that these antibodies can attack these calcium channels that are present on synaptic, on these um, somatic motor neurons that are supplying skeletal muscles. So you know these somatic motor neurons, they have on this kind of tip here at the synaptic terminal, they have these voltage-gated calcium channels. I'm going to put C-A-V. These are voltage-gated calcium channels. These antibodies will actually go and attack and bind on to these calcium channels. Now they can't work. Why is that important? Because the calcium channels are supposed to allow for calcium to flow into the neuron. And if calcium flows into these terminals, it'll increase the acetylcholine production, cause the muscle cell to become stimulated and contract. But if you block these calcium channels, you prevent calcium from coming into the synaptic terminal, you prevent the release of acetylcholine, and then you have less acetylcholine that can act in the synapse, leading to weakness. And this is called myasthenia gravis, but it's a very special subtype, and we have to remember this. It's actually called Lambert Eaton, Lambert Eaton subtype of myasthenia gravis. It'll present just like it. But again, think about that. All right, so we have the perineoplastic syndromes that we've discussed. Remember, squamous cell, hypercalcemia. Remember, adeno, hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. If you want to remember the hypercoagulable state, great. If you also want to remember potentially that they have the dermatomyositis, great. Carcinoid syndrome, remember wheezing, diarrhea, flushing. Small cell, remember Cushing. Syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, as well as CNS attack, so seizures, cerebellar degeneration, or Lambert-Eaton myasthenia gravis, okay? The last thing that I wanna quickly talk about is if the actual cancer that is situated within the lungs starts seeding and seeding into the actual vasculature and spreads throughout the body, what are the most common locations that you want to think about? Because if the patient comes to you, and obviously they have all the features of it that we just talked about, but then they have some additional features which are a little odd, you wanna be thinking about METs. So where are the most common locations that this cancer spread to? Remember, blab. Brain, liver, adrenals, and bone. Adrenal is usually going to be asymptomatic. You won't know. But the brain, think about seizures, okay? Think about some type of altered mental status. These are huge, or some type of neurodeficit. So if the patient's also presenting with neurodeficits or they're presenting with seizures, think about that metastasis to the brain. Liver, oftentimes this may cause hepatomegaly, but again, maybe some ascites, nothing super obvious, but think about potentially hepatomegaly or ascites. Adrenal, asymptomatic, bones, P. 
pain. They're gonna have lots of pain, particularly within areas of the joints or wherever that actual MET has spread to. So if the patient has additional features in what we just, to what we just talked about, such as neurodeficits, seizures, hepatomegaly or ascites, asymptomatic, and bone pain, think about it possibly of spreading outside of the lung now and metastasizing to other organs. All right, my friends, now what we're gonna do is move on to the diagnosis of lung cancer. All right, so we're now at diagnosis. You have a patient, you have a suspicion that they may have lung cancer. They're coming in with some of the features of weight loss, some low-grade fevers, they have some fatigue, maybe they have some of the compressive symptoms, right? Endobronchial growth or outside of it compressing the actual bronchial system. They have some of the nearby mediastinal compression, they have some of the pleural diseases, they got a pancose tumor, they got perineoplastic syndromes. They got symptoms that are also concerning maybe for some metastasis to either the brain, the liver, the adrenals, the bone. And you're trying to figure out, do they have something in their lungs? Or maybe you're trying to rule out that it's something else and it has nothing to do with lung cancer. Maybe they have an ammonia. Maybe they have something else that's going on that has nothing to do with lung cancer. The initial test to start off with these patients is a chest x-ray. It may give you just a generalized look. It's not going to be the best test, but it should be the initial kind of like screening test to start off saying, is this maybe lung cancer or is it something else? And we'll take a look at a bunch of different chest x-rays to kind of give you an idea of what something could look like if it's lung cancer. And then we'll also talk about pulmonary nodules. The next thing is if you think that it could be some type of odd shaped mass or it could be malignant and they have some of the risk factors, they smoke cigarettes, they have radon exposure, they have asbestosis exposure or asbestos exposure, they have a family history, etc then it might be warranted to say, let's go ahead and take a better look at this and let's do a CT of the chest with IV contrast. And it'll really help me to get a good look at that mass. From there, if you think that it definitely is a mass, what I would say next is, could it have spread? Is this a solitary mass that's only kind of localized to the lungs or did it decide to spread to the brain, to the liver, to the adrenals, to the bone, to the nearby lymph nodes? So how do I do that? Sometimes what may be best is doing one of two things. You may start off with a CT scan of the head, the chest, the abdomen, and the pelvis. And take a look and say, is these actual lung cancer, did it metastasize to the brain? So do I have any mets in the brain? Is it in the liver? Is there any hepatic mets? Look at the bones. Maybe you might be able to pick that up on CT again. Is there any kind of bony mets? Is there any adrenal mets? So this may be a, a good thing. Another thing that we may actually do, and it's kind of more preferred because it really gives us a good look, um, is we can use what's called a radio tracer. So we can give them a special type of like isotope of glucose, and it'll kind of light up different areas where there's mets that metastasize, again, from the lung cancer. And it's called a PET CT scan. And so those are really two of the tests that we could do if we think, oh, this definitely looks like a lung cancer, or we biopsy and we confirm that it's lung cancer, we can then do a pan CT scan or a PET CT to look for distant mets. Now, you know, these are just speculation. So without true pathological data, I can't say it's lung cancer, and I can't tell you what kind of lung cancer it is based upon the suspicion of a chest x-ray or a CT scan or a PET CT. I can have an idea, but I can't guarantee which type it is until I take a piece of the tissue, look under the microscope and say, Oh, that's small cell. Oh, that's adeno. And we're not gonna go over the histology of these. That's more of a step one thing. But for right now, what I want you to understand is biopsy is truly the key to determining the type of cancer. You have a suspicion of cancer, it's chest x-ray. You see something, you wanna get a better look at it, CT of the chest with IV contrast. Do you think that it metastasized to other organs? PET CT, PAN CT. Let's take a look at a bunch of those images and get a better idea. All right, so let's take a look at some images. We're gonna take a look at some chest x-rays, some CT scans, et cetera. So first thing, we get a chest x-ray for a patient who's coming in with maybe some concerning features of something pathologically going on inside of their chest, right? We get the chest x-ray, we get an initial look, and we see this big old goombach inside of their chest. Obviously, we see some type of mass here. We have no idea how extensive it is. Some of the other anatomy, like the heart and hilar area, may be kind of obstructing our view of it. But we definitely see some type of like pretty enlarged mass here in that left hemithorax. So that would be one kind of clue. So again, think about that if the patient is coming in with those classic symptoms or features, complications that we discussed. Now, 
that could be one potential finding. That might not be the only finding that you see to find or diagnose a patient who has lung cancer. You know what else you could potentially do? We could get another chest x-ray. Maybe this is the only finding, but it leads you down kind of a series of tests that ultimately helps with the diagnosis of lung cancer. What other kind of images or findings could we see on chest x-ray? Let me show you. All right, so we have another chest x-ray. We have a patient here who we're concerned that they may have something going on pathologically within their chest. We get a chest x-ray, we see this, and you see this, whoa, what is all this? I can't see my costophrenic angle here. Like there's no complete kind of delineation. You see over here we have our diaphragm and then it kind of like comes down nicely. This is our costophrenic angle. You see how it's just obliterated or blunted. And we see there's like this like meniscus sign. This is a pleural effusion. This patient actually has an underlying mass as the potential cause for this pleural effusion. What it, how can we prove that? We can take a needle, tap it in there, pull some of that fluid off and send it off for, for some cytology. And if we're concerned, we can even do a pleural biopsy. So those could be potential findings that would make us lead us down the, the road of saying, hey, this pleural fusion is actually due to an underlying lung cancer. What other kind of findings could we see on chest x-ray? All right, we got another chest x-ray here. The patient we have is complaining of some dyspnea. We obviously get a chest x-ray. We're concerned that maybe they have some concerning findings of kind of thoracic pathology. And we see here, oh, they got a pneumothorax. Well, this is a pneumothorax on that left side. What could be the potential etiology? Well, obviously we're gonna talk about that in plural disorders. It could be due to a primary disorder. It could be due to some type of like secondary problem like COPD or malignancy where it's near the actual periphery eating through the pleura and creates an opportunity for a pneumothorax to be formed. If we were to actually get a CT scan, they would actually find that this patient had an underlying mass that was very close to the periphery that led to this patient's pneumothorax. So again, the not only are you always going to find a very perfect lung mass on the chest x-ray, you may have other findings on their chest x-ray that is concerning of lung cancer, such as a pleural effusion, a pneumothorax, or again, maybe just a perfect like mass that you'll actually see there. Now, the next thing is what if it's actually not like a very large mass, it's more of on that area of a pulmonary nodule. What would that kind of look like? Do you guys remember? Let's take a look at that chest x-ray. All right, so here we have a patient who has, again, some no specific kind of like symptoms, but we get a chest x-ray because we're working them up for something else. And then, oh, we see something on their chest x-ray here. You see how it's like very round. It actually doesn't have a lot of calcifications that are asymmetric. Size-wise, hopefully it's, I, I can't, I don't have like a, the actual calipers that I could actually extend out and measure, but let's say that it's actually less than three centimeters. There's normal lung tissue surrounding it. There's no associated lymphadenopathy. This is a pulmonary nodule. And if we have a pulmonary nodule, what is the differential? 70% of the time it's benign. So something like a granuloma from TB, histiococcidio, or a hamartoma. Guess what this patient ended up having? They ended up having a hamartoma. You want to know how? I'll show you in a second because we ended up getting a CT to get a better look at this and we'll be able to see that it's very nicely round, dense central calcifications, less than two centimeters. They were less than 50. They did not smoke. It wasn't getting any bigger on serial uh, chest x-rays or CT scans. So again, this would be very, very perfect finding of a pulmonary nodule. And then again, know how to be able to have a suspicion for malignancy versus benign. All right, that takes our chest x-ray findings. Now let's go ahead and move into some of the CT findings that give us a better look at these lung masses. All right, so we have a patient, we got that chest x-ray, we saw that big kind of like lung mass um, on their chest x-ray, but we want to get a better look at it. When we get a better look at it, we can do a CT scan of the chest with IV contrast. And when we do that, guess what we end up kind of finding on this patient? You get a CT scan, it just gives you a way better look here. And you're going to see that they have a pretty decent sized mass. You see that thing right there in that posterior part of their chest? That's definitely a pretty big lung mass. If you wanted to get it in another view, we could actually put in a lung window. Look at that. That's a huge, like centrally located mass. If you wanted to look at it in another view, you could see here, this is a large centrally located mass. So you see how this helps us to get a really, really good look um, at the chest and get a better idea of what this actual mass looks like, helping us to have a better degree of suspicion if this is benign or malignant. I would definitely go as far as to say, this is irregular, it has asymmetric calcifications, it's extremely large, and the patient's history is more suggestive of it being malignant. So definitely a concerning finding here. And again, because it's more centrally located, we would wanna think about what could it be? Could it be squamous cell? Could it be some type of small cell lung cancer? Those would be the things to be thinking about. All right, so another CT scan, we have a patient's chest, right? So we're trying to determine, is this some type of like lung cancer? Is this a pulmonary nodule? Do you guys see here, we took a kind of a snap picture here at one point. Look at this. You see how there's like this dense central calcification. It's nice and round, nice and circular, probably less than three centimeters, I'd say. 
What do you think about this? This definitely looks like more of a pulmonary nodule. So think about your differential. What's the differentials? Is it a granuloma? Is it a hamartoma? Or is it some type of malignancy? I would go more on the line of this being more likely benign. So it's either a granuloma or hamartoma. This actually happened to be a hamartoma. We can get a better look at this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys a better look at this actual hamartoma. So when we do that, look at this. We got the lung window on for this patient and you're gonna be able to see, look at that actual dense kind of like opacity there that we see in that right lobe. Boom, that is a hamartoma. And what we could do is if we had a degree of suspicion, is this malignant, is this benign? What could we do if we have an intermediate pretest probability or an intermediate probability of it being malignant? We could do a PET CT scan, see if that lights up, see if we have any distant METs. Um, if we do, we could biopsy. If we have a very high degree of probability that that's it, then we can go ahead and biopsy right off the get-go. But again, these are findings that you may see off the CT scan of the chest. Now, we did a chest x-ray, we had a good look, we had an initial look at the actual mass or some other associated findings like pleural effusion, pneumothorax. We also get a CT scan to get a better look at the mass, any other kind of like size of the mass, get a little better look if we think it's a pulmonary nodule versus a malignant type of mass. The next thing we should do is a CT of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, head to be able to do what? Look for any metastasis, right? So that's a really big test to be able to do. So if I were to go ahead and actually pull up this scan here, this happened to be a CT, we did a pan CT on this patient, but I'm gonna show you one portion of it. Look what happens here with this patient. We're coming down into the abdomen and pelvis area. Do you see their liver? You see all these like hypodensities there? This patient has hepatic mets. So we know that if their primary problem, this actually happened to be a, pan, a patient who had small cell lung cancer, and then it metastasized to their actual liver, to their adrenal glands, to their bones, and we can see evidence of that here. So this would be one of the things. I could do that pan CT scan to look to see did it metastasize. I could also pull it up on the head CT. Do they have any mets inside of the brain? So again, start off with their chest x-ray to get an initial look. You see it. Is it more nodule? Is it more malignant? Again, look at the history, look at the size, look at the borders, look at the calcifications, get a CT of the chest with IV contrast to get a better look at it. You do that, you have a degree of suspicion that's malignant, maybe you need to biopsy it, maybe you need to do a pan CT or a PET CT to look for distant METs. You do a pan CT, you see METs in particular locations that it should go, bone, uh, brain, liver, adrenal. Or you can do a PET CT scan to look for also distant METs as well. Let's take a look at a PET CT scan now. So here we have a PET CT scan of a patient that has, again, some type of cancer. And what we're looking for is did it metastasize? And you see how we're going to have some lymph nodes that are actually kind of like lighting up here. And then look at the humerus. You see the bone here? The humeral bone is lighting up like a Christmas tree. This happened to be a patient who had METs that spread to their actual right humerus. And even look, look at their vertebrae. They have some METs that extended to their vertebrae as well. So you see these like really red hot spots. This happens to be the bladder. This is clearing out of the contrast, but so that's not actually a malignant area. But you look here at the vertebrae, the, the bones in the vertebrae, and look here at the humerus. They're lighting up here. And then the lymph nodes as well. So this is definitely some METs that we're able to see that came from a primary lung cancer. So again, start off with your chest x-ray, then get the CT of the chest with IV contrast. Look for distant METs with a pan CT, head, chest, abdomen, pelvis with IV contrast or a PET CT to look for any distant METs, and then follow up with the next step, which we're gonna get back at the whiteboard for, which is the biopsy. All right, so we looked at the images. We have a suspicion that they have lung cancer. Maybe it has a metastasized, maybe it hasn't metastasized. Regardless, we don't know which kind it is. The only way that we can truly definitively determine which kind it is is to send it off the pathology to under the microscope. So we have to get a biopsy of some kind or some type of cytological uh, you know, piece for us to be able to examine and figure out is this small cell, is this adeno, is this squamous cell. And again, we're not gonna go over what that looks like histologically, that's more of a kind of a step one thing. I think the big thing is understanding that you need a biopsy to determine the actual type of cancer that it is because that's gonna determine how aggressive you're gonna be with treatment. So I think the big thing to think about is where is the tumor? So if the tumor's in the lumen, it's actually in the lumen of the bronchus, I can do a bronchoscopy. I can stick a camera down through the trachea, down through the actual primary bronchi, find in one of the bronchioles where this tumor is, I can take a piece of that, send it off to pathology, see what kind it is. So for a tumor in the lumen, you can do what's called a bronchoscopy, and you can biopsy it via what's called a transbronchial biopsy. Now, what if the tumor is kind of invaded into the actual wall of the actual bronchial system, and then it looks like it's even seeded, or maybe 
you just see a lymph node, a big kind of like hyalur lymph node that looks like it has a mass type of appearance to it. So a, a nearby lymph node has actually been invaded and you have some lymphadenopathy. What if I want to be able to test to see did the cancer spread to the lymph node, but it's outside the lumen. If I want to be able to test that, then I have to take and stick a needle through the wall of the bronchial into the lymph node, but I got to be careful. So how do I do that? I use a ultrasound while I'm in the bronchus to guide the needle through the wall of the bronchus out into the lymph node. So we do a bronchoscopy, but we needle aspirate parts of the tumor out of the lymph node via what's called an endobronchial ultrasound guidance. It's actually pretty cool. But again, this would be more for your central tumors, right? So you see how if it's a tumor kind of within the bronchus system, it's likely a central tumor, small cell, squamous cell, maybe carcinoid, maybe one of the bronchoalveolar, less likely adeno, less likely large cell. So that would be for these. Now, if you have a tumor that's toward the periphery, it's not safe to be able to send a, bronchus, uh, a bronchoscopy, to send a camera all the way down through these tiny little bronchioles. You won't be able to find it, and it's not safe. So from that, we take a outside approach. We wanna go through the chest wall. And so sometimes what we'll do is we have to get into this actual tumor and aspirate part of the tumor out. But in order for us to do that, we need to be very careful. So sometimes we'll do this under CT guided, kind of like uh, using a CT scan step by step as we guide our needle to the tumor to aspirate some of the tumor cells out so that we can send it to pathology. If that's not best, sometimes what we can do is we can actually go in with cameras into the actual chest. So we'll actually stick kind of like these cameras into the chest wall and we'll actually watch on video as the needle goes and we take a piece of the actual tissue of that cancer that we see on the lung, okay? So if it's a peripheral tumor, there's two options. One, CT guided needle aspiration or what's called a video assisted thoracoscopy. Uh, thoracoscopy. Well, sometimes we actually refer to this as a VATS procedure. So you may see that as well, a VATS procedure. All right, so peripheral tumors, adeno, peripheral, maybe bronchoalveolar, maybe uh, carcinoid because they can be both. The last thing is, what if we don't really have any of these, but we have a patient who has a big WAP and pleural effusion? And here's the key thing, malignant pleural effusion. So they, it keeps happening. So even though they have, they, we've proved that it has nothing to do with their, you know, an underlying kind of cause like, such as congestive heart failure or uh, cirrhosis or nephrotic syndrome or any other kind of thing, we can actually go in do a thoracentesis. So maybe there was a mass that's near the periphery. Remember I told you if you have a mass near the periphery, it's going to increase the capillary permeability, cause fluid to leak into this, or it can compress a lymphatic vessel and decrease the clearance. But either way, maybe some of these cells of the cancer may be mixed into that pleural fluid. So I may have cancer cells in that pleural fluid. If I take a needle and I go into the pleural cavity, aspirate some of that off, and I pull back all this fluid, I may pull back fluid that's gonna be a mixture, right? So obviously there may be protein, there may be plasma, there may be some cells and things like that, there may be blood, but what else will I pull back? Maybe some cells. I can send that to pathology and have them check out the cells and say, oh, is there any types of malignant cells there? And if I'm curious, what I could do is I could actually go in and take a piece, I could biopsy a piece of the pleura and really confirm that. So if I had some suspicion, I could follow up on this with what's called a pleural biopsy. But either way, you guys get the point that all of these, we require a biopsy to determine the type of malignancy or type of uh, cancer it is. Now that we've gone through this, we figured out the different ways that we can confirm. The next thing that I really want us to talk about is we have a mass on the chest x-ray or the CT scan but it doesn't, you're not sure, is this benign? Is this malignant? Did they have it before? Oh, they did have it before. Did it get bigger? It's important to understand this. I'm serious. This is a huge point for your step two exam. We have to know if this pulmonary nodule is benign, malignant, how to work it up, how to follow up, and when to be suspicious for malignancy. Let's talk about that now. All right, so you get a chest x-ray. You see that nodule that we talked about, right? What looks like a pulmonary nodule. Less than three centimeters, normal surrounding lung parenchyma, no lymphadenopathy. You have a degree of suspicion that is benign, but you're not completely sure if it's a malignant. One of the best things to do is when you see a pulmonary nodule, a solitary pulmonary nodule, is to compare it to prior films. So do they have a previous chest x-ray? Do they have a previous CT that I can look at to see was that nodule there prior? That's the first thing, because if it's new, that's a whole different story. Second is the nodule was there on the prior chest x-ray. Is it bigger? Has it gotten bigger within the past maybe year or two years? 
or do they have no prior films that actually show that nodule? That's a very first question. So you see the nodule, three questions. Do they have a prior film? If they do, is it bigger? Second, is it a new one? Third, I have no prior films to compare. Once you do that, that leads you to the next step. Okay, you see it, you say, oh, I see that they did have a prior nodule about maybe a year or two back. It's gotten bigger, it's actually gotten bigger. Okay, and then I actually look at it and I say, oh, well, this is actually completely new. This wasn't there on the prior image. Oh, okay, so it's a new nodule or it's a nodule that's gotten bigger. If that's the case, you need to get a better look at it. So you wanna get a CT scan and get thin sections of it to be able to get a better look at the actual mass or that nodule. And once you look at it, then that can lead you to the question, is this more malignant or is this more benign? Because it's malignant, I may have to go and biopsy that if I have a high degree of suspicion that it's malignant or resect a piece of it, depending upon where it is, which we just talked about. But if it's benign, I could probably just like follow up. And how frequent would I follow up? Maybe I would just follow up in like maybe a, you know, a couple months, three months, okay? Take a look at it, does it get any bigger? Does it look any different? It's the same thing, okay? This is the big kind of step here. So I want you to remember this part. You have an nodule, old chest x-ray, old image. Is it bigger? Is it new? If the answer is yes, you go to a CT scan, okay? After you get the CT with thin sections, you can get a better look at it to say, is this more likely malignant? Is this more likely benign? If I think it's malignant, and we'll talk about what are the suspicious factors for that, you biopsy it or resect it. If it's likely benign, you follow up in three months and just see if it got any bigger or if you have a new nodule that pops up. Now, if the nodule hasn't changed, hasn't gotten any bigger, it's not a new nodule, then what you can do is follow up in a year and just see, has it gotten any bigger? Have you developed any new nodules? That's it. So if it has not changed in size from prior films, you just follow up in a year. If you had no prior films, you have to assume that it's a new nodule, okay? Or that if they did have it and you just can't find the films, that has gotten bigger. So you go straight to the same concept, get a CT with thin sections. If it's suspicious for malignancy, res uh, biopsy resect. If it's more likely benign, follow up in three months, okay? Nodule, looks new, or bigger, don't have prior films, CT, if it's suspicious from malignancy, what are those things we'll talk about? You biopsy it. If it's not, you just follow up in a year. If you have a prior image, you look at it, it's no different, has gotten any bigger in the past two years, you follow up in a year. All right, now the question is, is what are those factors that make me more suspicious for a malignant nodule than a benign nodule? Let's talk about that. All right, so let's assume the worst. Let's assume that we think that this is malignant. If that's the case, what are the factors that should come up in your head to make you think malignant? First thing is age. How old is the patient? The older they are, the more likely it's malignant. Generally, we say if they have an age greater than 50, they have a high likelihood of it being malignant, okay? That's one thing. Second thing is do they smoke? If they do smoke, it has a higher incidence of malignancy. What's the only cancer that it is not associated with malignancy though? Adenocarcinoma. So this would not really apply to an adenocarcinoma. Think about that. The next thing is when we look at the chest x-ray, we actually want to get a better look at this nodule. So chest x-ray CT scan, when you look at it, you really want to get an idea of this nodule. So the first thing is you see the nodule and you see it on the chest x-ray, or you see it on the thin sections of the CT scan, what's the size? So the size does matter <laughs> in this situation. Is it greater than two centimeters? If it is greater than two centimeters, then you definitely should have more of a likelihood of suspicion that this is malignant. So the larger it is, greater than two centimeters, more likely it is malignant. The next thing is the borders. If you look at the borders and they're irregular, so in other words, it's not like a perfect circle. It looks like, like this. It's kind of like wonky looking, right? That is way more suspicious for a malignancy. So if it has like all these different projections off of it, it's not kind of like a nice circular type of structure, more likely that this is malignant. So if they have irregular borders, this is another big thing. All right, the next component here is calcifications. So if you look at it and you notice that they have calcifications, let's draw this here in this pinkish color. But you notice that usually it's kind of like asymmetric. So it's like right here, maybe some here. There's no complete symmetry to it. That is a huge situation. So classification for this component here, calcification I mean, if it is asymmetric, this is a huge one. The reason why is if it's more benign, oftentimes benign nodules will be again smaller. 
they'll be more circular, they won't have irregular types of borders, and their calcification is usually dense and centrally located. They usually have a dense central kind of calcification. That's more likely to be benign. So less than two centimeters, very perfect circular structure, no irregular borders, and dense central calcification rather than asymmetric calcification with irregular borders and larger than two centimeters. The next thing is it changed in size. If it has gotten bigger, it is likely malignant. So has it enlarged? If it is enlarged, it is likely malignant. These are the things that you should be thinking about when you're going through this algorithm. What's their age? What's their smoking history? What's the size of it? What's the borders look like? What's the calcification look like? And again, has it gotten bigger? If these answers are yes, or what we just put down, have a degree of suspicion for malignancy, and then go to biopsy. If most of these aren't answered and you're saying, oh, a lot of these are actually not the case, they're actually less than 50, they don't smoke, it's less than two centimeters, it's regular borders, they have dense central calcification, it's not getting any bigger within the past two years, guess what, likely benign, follow up in a couple months, okay? So that's the bit, or it hasn't changed in general, then you can follow up in a year, okay? But again, these are the big things that you wanna be able to kind of think about whenever you're working up a patient with a pulmonary nodule. All right, and again, what would I say if this is a benign? It's more likely a granuloma from TB, histo, coccidio, maybe a prior infection. So look for an infectious history or think hamartoma. All right, let's move on to the treatment and prevention process. All right, so we're gonna talk about treatment. It's gonna be pretty quick, should be easy. This isn't a super high yield port. There's one point out of this that I really want you guys to understand, so we're gonna kind of blow through the treatment because it's not gonna be something that you guys will see too much of on the actual exam. But quickly, you have a patient who has a pulmonary nodule, we already kind of have an idea. A lot of the time it's follow-up or biopsy. So if it's low probability, you know, less than 50, less than two centimeters, regular borders, central disc calcifications, um, they don't smoke, and again, it's not getting any bigger, low probability, just follow up, serial CT scans, right? So get a serial image in about three months or a year. Again, it depends upon if it got bigger prior, but again, usually it's just follow up. If it's intermediate, so some of those questions are actually answered, so maybe they smoke, maybe they are greater than 50, but maybe it doesn't have irregular borders, maybe it has asymmetric calcification, but again, it's not complete, well-defined suspicious for malignancy, then you can have an intermediate probability. I'd say go next to say, let's get a PET CT scan. If there is that the case where you actually do look at it, you're not completely sure, but then let's say, let's say that we do think it's malignant. If it is malignant, usually those cancers have a higher risk of METs, but you know, benign, they don't, they don't metastasize. So if you get a PET CT and it is positive and they've actually metastasized to other areas, then you know it's malignant, then you're gonna go ahead and biopsy it and figure out what kind it is. Okay, so intermediate probability, you're not completely sure, you think it could be, could not be, get a PET CT scan, look to see if it's metastasized, or a PAN CT, one of the two. PET CT is probably a little bit better. If it's positive, biopsy. High probability, they answer all those questions, you go straight to a biopsy, okay? Pretty straightforward. All right, let's now talk about the treatment for non-small cell lung cancers. So it's unlikely that you'll get questions on staging. So I don't wanna to go too crazy, I wanna make it super easy. There's a simplified schema to staging and treatment respectively. And this is the way I like it, I think it's the easiest to remember. When we think about stage one, it's just an isolated tumor. It hasn't involved any kind of like nearby lymph nodes. For that situation, that's easy to be able to resect. So you can do surgery and then maybe shrink any of the actual or kill any of the other surrounding cells there with chemotherapy, okay? So if it's very localized, isolated surgery chemo. Now, if it has spread some hilar lymph nodes, okay, then it's a little bit of a different story. So you can still resect that tumor, but hit some chemotherapy and radiation therapy to really kill any of the remaining cells. If it's now spread to the hilar lymph nodes and the mediastinum, that's a little bit more specific. You have to ask the question, can it be resected? If it can be resected, it's stage 3A. If it cannot be resected, it's stage 3B. What does that mean if it can, can be resected? That means you can do surgery. But what you should do is try to shrink it down the best that you can. So start with chemo radiation, and if it's possible to safely be resected, surgery. For stage 3B where it's unresectable, do you see surgery as an option here? No surgery, can't be resected safely. Shrink it down as much as you can, and then if you get the actual pathology and you test for any specific mutation, this is past the scope of this lecture, but sometimes they may have a very special type of mutation that you can give them specific biologic agents, immunotherapy, to target the actual cancer cells. That's what I want you to remember. Unresectable, you can't do surgery though. Shrink it, consider biologics if they have the mutation. Last one, stage four, it's metastasized. 
it's all over the place. If that's the case, you cannot do any surgery. <clears throat> At that point, it's just chemo. And you can consider some monoclonal antibody therapy as well, some biologics. That would be the big things that I want you guys to remember for this one. All right, let's now work our way up back to small cell lung cancer. All right, so this one's a little bit of a beast. Small cell lung cancer, I think one of the big things to know for the prognosis of this one, it's very, very poor. By the time somebody has been diagnosed with small cell lung cancer, their five-year survival rate is like very low. They might, might have like, you know, it's, it's pretty much like, they're not gonna survive past that. It's about one to two year uh, lifespan whenever they're diagnosed. It's so extensive by the time it's actually found. So the prognosis for small cell lung cancer is very, very poor. If you by some amazing chance catch it at the limited stage, meaning that it's only occupying one of the part of the thorax and the hilar lymph nodes, you can consider chemo radiation to really try to shrink that down. And then what you can do is prevent one of the scariest locations for this to metastasize is the brain because you're gonna have focal neural deficits, seizures, a lot of nasty problems, even potential hemorrhages. So because of that, it's really good to prophylactically do cranial irradiation to the brain in this situation. So limited small cell lung cancer where it's only in one side of the lung, only the same uh, location of the hilar lymph nodes, unilateral, you can consider chemo radiation and prophylactic cranial irradiation. But if it's extensive, meaning it's in both thoraxes, both bilateral hilar lymph nodes and METs. There's no benefit to this situation for radiation, chemo, and you can consider prophylactic cranial irradiation as well to prevent if it hasn't already spread to the brain at this point in time, okay? That's small cell. I think one of the biggest points that I really need you guys to get out of the whole treatment second is, is section is this. Because these cancers oftentimes are caught late, one of the biggest things to do is prevent. Obviously, smoking cessation is a huge factor here. But what if we could catch it before it's getting too extensive? And so because patients who are smokers, specifically a 30 or more pack year history, so if they have a 30 or more pack year history, or they're a current smoker, they're still smoking with a greater than 30 pack year history, or they were a former smoker, so don't count these people out, less than 15 years ago. So if they actually quit, but it's still less than 15 years ago, they still qualify for getting these low dose yearly CT scans. And then the age range that you should start screening these patients, and this is very, very important for those primary care facilities, is 55 to 80 years of age. Some will say, um, so sometimes they'll actually say like 74, but again, for the most part, most of the recommendations say 55 to 80 years of age um, that you want to consider getting yearly low dose CT scans to look for any types of pulmonary nodules or lung masses that you can catch them early. Do not forget this. Current, former, less than 15 years, greater than or equal to 30 pack year history, age 55 to 80, yearly low dose CT scans to prevent lung cancer. All right, now let's do some cases. All right, my friends, let's do a case. So we, here we have a 66-year-old male presents to the engineer hospital with fatigue, cough, dyspnea, dysphagia, hoarse voice. It's a lot of symptoms. Patient states it's been going on for the past three months. Past medical history pertinent for tobacco abuse. Physical exam, what do we got? SP2 is a little low, 92%. Respiratory rate's 20, that's appropriate. Heart rate's appropriate. Temperature, just low-grade fever. And then blood pressure is 138 over 78, which is appropriate. All right, physical exam findings are interesting. So they have wheezing. That could be due to the endobronchial tube, like if there is a tumor here, like a lung cancer in this situation. If it's within the bronchus or it's outside the bronchus compressing on it, could be a response for the wheezing. Abdominal obesity, swollen moon face, buffalo hump, edematous and discolored upper limbs and chest. That's interesting. That could be potentially due to a perineoplastic syndrome, like Cushing syndrome. You can see that with the small cell carcinomas. And then they have jugular venous distension that could be due to like a superior vena cava syndrome, like compression of the superior vena cava that's causing like a JVD and some of the discoloration of the upper limbs and chest and edema. So I could see a superior vena cava syndrome, a perineoplastic syndrome, a bronchial tube, either obstruction or compression from the outside. Then they have fatigue that's just generalized from the actual, um, from the lung cancer. 
dyspnea, dysphagia, that could actually be due to esophageal compression, and a hoarse voice, which could be due to recurrent laryngeal nerve compression. And they have a past medical history of tobacco abuse, which is their risk factor for lung cancer. So I think that this is pointing obviously towards a small cell lung cancer with a lot of like nearby compression. So you can see what kind of compressive symptoms they have. They have some type of like, if they had strider, it could be due to a tracheal compression. It could be they have esophagus, uh, esophageal compression. This could be causing dysphagia, which we see here. If they have recurrent laryngeal nerve compression, that could be causing hoarseness of, of the voice. If they have like an abronchial obstruction, whether it be in the lumen of the bronchus or in a compressing in the outside of the bronchus, that can cause wheezing during expiration and even a degree of dyspnea. And then on top of that, if you compress the superior vena cava, that could actually cause some type of like superior vena cava syndrome. So definitely things to watch out for in this patient. So how do we go about kind of diagnosing this? So we think that the patient has some type of like lung cancer with nearby compressive symptoms. I think getting a chest x-ray or a CT scan would kind of be nice. So if I start off with a chest x-ray, I'll be able to see that this is a centrally located mass. And that's really important because there's only certain types of masses that are more centrally located. Small cell lung carcinoma is one. Sometimes carcinoid, carcinoid tumors and squamous cell carcinoma are also those. So you can think about that. Think about small cell squamous and carcinoid. Now, perineoplastic wise, small cell lung cancer would make the most sense. But squamous cell carcinoma is a possibility. Carcinoid, usually you see that with having like wheezing, diarrhea, maybe like a serotonin syndrome. Squamous cell, they have kind of like an elevated PTHRP, which causes like hypercalcemia. Um, I think that this one makes more sense to be small cell, but again, I wouldn't be able to guarantee that until I actually go in and biopsy and look at that under the pathology. But with that being said, what are some of the perineoplastic syndromes to watch out for with these diseases? You see Cushing syndrome due to elevated levels of cortisol being produced um, in small cell lung cancer, which this patient really presents with similar symptoms of. SAADH, so due to ADH production from the tumor. Lambert-Eaton syndrome, where they actually produce like, you know, a reaction that actually can cause antibodies to attack the neuromuscular junction, particularly the calcium channels on the uh, neuromuscular junction or the neurons on the skeletal muscles. And the neurons that are actually supplying the skeletal muscles of the diaphragm and, and other parts. And then it can also cause like cerebellar degeneration and seizures to potentially occur as well. So I think that that's one big thing to think about. And then squamous cell, they cause a lot of what's called PTHRP release, which can actually cause hypercalcemia. And then carcinoid tumors can actually cause a lot of like serotonin to be released, which can cause serotonin syndrome and carcinoid syndrome, like wheezing, diarrhea, um, and, and also, you know, elevated serotonin levels that can cause other symptoms. So things to watch out for, such as what we've talked about all right here. And again, if we really wanted to, we can check this actual level here. We could actually go and we could say, hey, let's check the 5 hydroxy uh, acetic uh, the levels here and see if their 5 HIAA is uh, elevated in their urine. Um, that may be somewhat supportive of carcinoid syndrome. We can check the PTHRP levels and the calcium levels in squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and again, small cell lung cancer, you can consider checking their cortisol, maybe elevated, and you can also check their ACTH. And then for SADH, check the sodium levels. Whenever you reabsorb a lot of like water, you're going to actually kind of dilute up the sodium. And then again, Lambert-Eaton syndrome, you can actually check um, for these patients and look to see um, if they have any kind of like positivity on their um, myasthenia gravis testing processes. But this is how I would kind of go about looking at this, getting my chest x-ray CT scan to find a mass, come up with a differential of what, in my head of which one of these it likely could be, look at some of the actual characteristics of those. And I think if we look at these, carcinoid syndrome doesn't seem to be the case. Squamous cell doesn't seem to be the case, but small cell, does seem to be the case, especially with the evidence of Cushing syndrome in this patient. So I think it's small cell lung cancer. So how do I would really confirm this as a biopsy? I'd actually I'd need to go and find where this tumor is. Is it in the bronchus? Is it outside the bronchus? Is it in the periphery? If it's inside of the bronchus and it's more centrally located, usually we can do something like a um, a bronchoscopy and go and remove the tumor, or we may have to do an EBUS where we actually use ultrasound to guide us there. So in this situation here, what we find is, is that the actual tumor is actually located in the lumen of the bronchial system. Um, and if that's the case, then how do I actually go about doing that? You can do a bronchoscopy with a transbronchial biopsy. 
Um, and you can also do a needle aspiration of the lymph node via EBUS. So I could throw it to a bronch where we actually go down through the actual bronchi, and then we could actually take a piece of tissue from the, the actual lumen of the bronchial if the tumor is kind of in, in the actual lumen of the bronchial. And then if it did spread to the near, nearby lymph node just outside of the bronchial system, then what I could use is I could actually use a needle and via ultrasound guidance guide myself into the actual lymph node and suck some of the actual tumor out of that as well. So that's ways that we could do that if it's kind of a centrally located tumor. Now, we see here a CT scan to give us a better idea of the tumor and its centrally located pr presentation. And then we can also do things called PET scans or PAN-CT scans as well to really help us to stage the adenocarcinoma. So looking to see, has it spread anywhere? Has it metastasized? I could do a PAN-CT scan so I could scan their head, their chest, their abdomen, their pelvis and look for any distant mets. Or I can do a PET-CT to see if I see any hot spots where it does spread. I don't think that's important. What I do think that may come up in the exam is where does these actual lung cancers actually spread? And if they spread, they usually spread to blab. So brain, liver, and then adrenal and bones. So think about that, my friends. All right, how do we treat this patient? So I think it's important to remember if this tumor is actually located on the periphery, so towards the pleura, how do we actually approach that? And generally, that's a fine needle aspiration, but you'll do that via CT guidance, or you can do what's called video-assisted thoracoscopic uh, kind of like surgery there as well. So you can do a VATS. So either way, utilizing fine needle aspiration of the tumor from the peripheral kind of pleural area or plur peripheral kind of like pleural parenchyma area, we can do a fine needle via CT guidance, or you can do video-assisted kind of like thoracoscopic kind of removal of the tumor. What if they had a pleural effusion that was actually related to their malignancy? What could I do then? I could actually do a thoracentesis and send off the, uh, the pleural fluid for cytology to look for, see what kind of actually like malignancy pops up there as well. All right. We move on to the next case here. We got a 45 year old female with no pertinent past medical history presents to the Ninja Nerd Hospital for a deep laceration to the chest. She receives a chest x-ray and incidentally shows a coin shaped nodule in the right upper lobe. Very interesting. So I think this is trying to point us towards a pulmonary nodule versus a actual true lung mass. That's a cancer type. So is this benign or malignant is the question that we're trying to figure out here. So when we look at the vitals, we see relatively everything is normal. No kind of abnormalities pop up. We go to look at the chest x-ray, and when we look at it, here's what we note. We note a very kind of like small nodule, 1.5 centimeter circular nodule with a dense central calcification. That's good. Um, and when comparing to the prior films from two years ago, she actually never had this nodule. So that's interesting. So when we see a new nodule that is somewhat concerning, but just because it's new does not mean that it's actually malignant. It could still be benign. So I think one of the big things to think about is how do we actually kind of continue to follow up on this nodule? I really think a chest CT is going to be the best situation with thin slices to really get a good look at this nodule if it's a new nodule. And so let's actually say that we do that. And when we do that, what we see is, we see the nodules present here. It's about 1.6 centimeter circular nodule with a dense central calcification. And then there's no nearby lymphadenopathy and all the actual lung during the lung window examination shows no abnormal lung parenchyma. That's super, super critical, my friends. And so I think it's really important to think about that. So would you say that this pulmonary nodule is suspicious for malignancy or being benign? I think it's benign. And how do we think about this? Again, look at the age. She's less than 50, so that's one thing. Does she smoke? She has no pertinent past medical history of smoking. What's the size? It's 1.6 centimeters. That means it's less than two centimeters. Is the borders irregular or regular? It said that it was actually gen gen decently regular. Was their calcification central or asymmetric? It was centrally located, that's good. And was there a change in size? No, but it was there was a new, if you wanna say technically, yes, there was a new nodule. So one of these factors was potentially concerning, but out of everything else here, it definitely does not seem to be malignant. I think the best thing to consider here is really following up in a couple months and getting another low dose CT scan and making sure that that hasn't gotten any bigger or that new nodules have formed. So I would repeat a CT scan in about three months to see what does it look like now.
And I think the next question is, is what could it be if we think that it's benign? What is the responsibility of thinking what else could it be? It could be a granuloma like sarcoidosis or a hamartoma. So those are things to think about. And if it's in the rare occasion, it could be like a histo or coccidiomycosis, but not too common. I would think about, you know, things like sarcoid or, you know, hamartoma is likely being the likely cause here. All right, we go into the next case here. We get a 70-year-old male presents to the Ninjanerd Hospital with dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, hoarse voice, numbness, and weakness of the right arm. No pertinent past medical history is here. So we look at their vitals. Everything looks good. Nothing that really pops out as concerning except for one thing. SpO2 is a little bit low. So the SpO2 is a tad bit low, showing a mild, mild hypoxemia. When we examine them, we notice that they have decreased breath sounds on the right, okay, with decreased tactile fremitus and dullness to percussion. So whenever we hear decreased breath sounds, that means you're not inflating a part of the lung well. We have decreased tactile fremitus, meaning that there's fluid, usually in the plural fluid, and dullness to percussion, likely plural fluid. So there's a plural fusion most likely as the etiology here. When we also examine the patient, we notice that they have a right eye ptosis, we notice meiosis of their right eye, and we notice anhydrosis on the forehead of their right side. We notice edema and discoloration of their upper extremities, their trunk, and they have a bulbous kind of jugular vein that's distended. They also have weakness of their right upper extremity and less sensation to light touch on the right upper extremity. And then you notice on their fingers, they got like these swollen and spoon-like appearance of their digits, which is very interesting. So things that we're starting to see here, which is really, really odd, is we see that they have likely a pleural effusion, Horner syndrome, SVC syndrome, brachial plexus compression, and some type of weird spooning of the digits, which could be like what's called a hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. Um, so very interesting. So I think that we got to look on that chest x-ray or CT scan and really look at the apex in the right lung to make sure that they don't have something called a pancos tumor. So let's go ahead and check that out. So look at that right apex, boom, big honking tumor here. So this would be right in the vicinity of where the brachial plexus is. This would be in the vicinity of the sympathetic kind of like fibers. This would be in the vicinity of the superior vena cava. So we're, and we're also seeing here, look at this uh, pleural effusion here as well. So they got pleural effusion. They got a big old pancos tumor. They got a lot of the symptoms I think that would s explain this with them having a pancos tumor. So. I think again, pancos tumor, and usually the two types of tumors that will cause this is a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, usually they're more centrally located, but they can be near the apex, um, or adenocarcinomas as well. So I think one of the big things to think about are what are some of the other features does this patient have with the pancos? We already kind of talked about this, but they have horners because you're compressing their sympathetic plexus. Um, they have hoarseness due to recurrent laryngeal nerve compression. We actually see that right here. Um, they also have some degree of uh, uh, upper extremity swelling, discoloration, JVD, due to superior vena cava compression. Um, and we also probably see some Horner syndrome as we talked about due to compression of the actual uh, sympathetic fibers and plexus. And then we also see compression of the um, brachial plexus as well, which is causing some of their weakness on the right upper and decreased sensation on the right upper extremity as well. And then here's the thing, this is actually likely the cause of the spooning of the digits. Um, this is called hypertrophic osteoarthropathy and it's usually seen with adenocarcinoma. So we may be likely seeing that as a potential effect here. And it maybe is more likely to support adeno, but again, you need to really biopsy that to really see if that's truly the case. Um, and again, we also see that they have that pleural effusion plump in there. So which tumors I think are important to remember, we talked about the ones that are centrally located, that's usually small cell, that's usually carcinoid, that's usually squamous. The ones that are more peripherally located is usually gonna be like adenocarcinoma, usually like large cell carcinoma is another one that I would actually think about as well. So think about those. I think one of the big questions that you may actually see on the exam is which one out of all of the tumors, small cell, squamous cell, large cell, carcinoid, adeno, is not associated with smoking, and it's adenocarcinoma. And then how do I prove it's adeno? You gotta biopsy it. And so this is actually kind of more peripherally located. So because of that, I would do like a fine needle aspiration with CT guidance or a VATS. 
um, as the potential opportunity here. And if they have any pleural fluid that I could actually tap off that's likely from their malignancy, I could go ahead and do a thoracentesis and then send off some cytology there as well. And then again, staging, I think it's important to remember is to look for any METs. So scan their head, their chest, their abdomen, their pelvis. You can even do a PET scan to look for any hot spots as well. And again, I think that's the big, big location. But remember, where do they commonly metastasize to? Blab, brain, liver, adrenal, and bones. If this patient did have, if we were to quickly, quickly say that they had stage 3A adenocarcinoma, what does that mean for their stages? I wouldn't work too hard on this. I'll bring up the kind of diagram that we talked about on the whiteboard, but stage one is it's usually gonna be kind of like localized to one hemithorax. If it goes to the hemithorax and the ipsilateral lymph nodes, that's stage two. If it goes here to the other lymph nodes as well, and it starts getting a lot bigger, then we're starting to see stage 3A. And in this case, we're starting to see, again, as we go stage 3B, and then stage four, we're starting to see it spread into the actual systemic circulation. So I think that's kind of the big thing to think about here is that in this patient, um, I think that what we'll see is what does that stage mean and what would the treatment be? Well, in this case, the mass is actually spread to their mediastinum. So it's actually gone from being in the lung, it's spread all the way to the nearby lymph nodes, and then from the lymph nodes, it's spread into the actual mediastinum as well. Um, and then from there, we start seeing that it actually starts spreading again further off. Because generally, we have it localized, then to the lymph nodes, then to the lymph nodes and mediastinum, um, where it can still potentially be resected, then into the nearby lymph nodes, mediastinum, where it cannot be resected, and then usually into the lung parenchyma, lymph nodes, mediastinum cannot be resected, and systemic metastasis as well. So in this situation here, it's still possible for you to resect it, um, but you're going to need a lot of chemo radiation to really shrink the tumor as well. All right, my friends, so that would cover this kind of lecture and cases on lung masses. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Love you, thank you, and as always, until next time.